Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really excited about the, this panel because we're going to bring two, generation on, on, two generations on stage, two, <laughs> two different, uh, one large organization, one startup. But you're going to see that both of them have a very similar uh, understanding of the future of work. So please welcome on stage Aransa Balson, uh, who's the head of talent for uh, Accor Hotels. Welcome. And uh, Rodolf, uh, I, I forgot your surname, is Dutel. So Rodolf Dutel, who's the head of uh, operations for Buffer. Um, so Buffer is, uh, is a tool that you can use to uh, schedule your tweets and, 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 and post on Facebook. Uh, but beyond that, it's a, a very uh, well-known uh, company uh, because they implemented, implemented openness, transparency, and they also tried to implement a 100% uh, flat organization. So oh, there are uh, 100 employees uh, in 20 cities all around the world. Uh, and you said the maximum uh, number of employees in a city is like is six, right? Yeah, we have up to six people in the same city, and we're distributed all across the world. So 50% in U.S., 50% internationally. So Arangsa uh, is responsible for, for talents at Aqua Hotel, so it's, it's what you would have called in the past uh, human resources. It's, it's true that it's a, it's a really horrible world, right? Hor why, why, why do we, do we call... It's not my fault. Yeah. <laughs> I think we all heritated of that. Uh, we just changed the name from HR to Talent and Culture just to make sure that we focus on the right things. So administration and uh, all of these kind of things and uh, processes, I mean, it's not what we are really targeting. What we target is individuals in, the, in an environment, an ecosystem, that is make them being happy, efficient, and uh, getting value and giving value. So the culture is extremely important. It's what is happening among people and what is uh, making us being identified as something different. So For how yeah. many? 200,000 people, employees all around the world, right? 2,040 very soon. Okay. 2004. So, so 240,000. 240,000. So before we get into details, I, I, I cannot uh, prevent myself from asking you what did you think because I, I, I was looking at you and I saw that you were uh, being very attentive to, to, the, to the talk before. Uh, wh what do you think of happiness at work? Should that be a, a consequence or should that be a, a, an objective? And how can we build a culture maybe you know, built around this, this, this idea? So that's such a great one. I was listening to the, uh, the previous talk and um, starting with regrets you may have at the end of your life really helps you to get centered on values. So what is it that you enjoy doing day in, day out? We are it, at a day and age where people are moving around. You can change countries. You can speak different languages. You can do so many different things with your day and your time that now companies and places where you get to work is not only providing you a livelihood and a salary, but it also creating a nurturing place for you to grow, for you to feel good about yourself and perform so many different jobs. So, in fact, I think that creating a compelling culture and have it as a, one of the primary drivers of what it is you do will help you attract talents, have people feel pretty good about going to work in the morning and not like the person we've seen before, which was struggling to get out of bed. And... Um, Oftentimes, that comes through giving a framework, and that could be values, for instance. I think setting values is the first step towards having the right framework for people to be happy at work. In fact, I cannot be more in agreement with you. First of all, are you happy? Because yeah, I am. Very much so. So, yeah. Which means that you can be very happy whether you are in a very, a very large organization, a very complex, and in a very small and flat. I mean, uh, and that is, uh, at the end of the day, what is driving performance uh, for, for the individuals, for the teams, and also for... Uh, for the customers. So yeah, I agree on that. And um, the, the key difference is, is that sometimes it's much more complex uh, when you have a, a strong organization that is very, with a many layers and uh, a lot of processes, a lot of history. 
um, to really create or recreate a space where everybody can feel that way and uh, being happy to come and uh, having a clear view of what is expected from them and, uh, and how they can leave a fingerprint because at the end of the day, what you want is to be free and leave a fingerprint behind you, right? So, so the reason why I was really interested in having you together on stage is because uh, Accor Hotels uh, is structured kind of vert vertically. Ho hotels traditionally are uh, organized in a very vert vertical fashion. And you at Angsa, with all your team, you're trying to change the, the culture and change the, the organization toward more horizontal and, and collaborative management. And pretty much the, the opposite is happening at Buffer because you, you, you started as a, a super flat organization and you told me that now uh, there are leaders who are responsible also for uh, teamwork. So could you maybe start, Rodolf, explaining what worked in this flat organization and why did you leave this, this kind of super flat organization and, and how do you guys work and nowadays? Cool. So absolutely. Buffer is a software company that is headquartered in the US. 50% are in the US, 50% are outside of the US. We are in run about 25 different cities today. So we build software and to do that, we try and work together. Uh, you have to work fast, you have to work in small teams and try to get things through the door. It's a very competitive environment for startups and it's very important for us to get to push product through the door. So we did an experiment for nine months. We decided to part ways with traditional hierarchy. What that means is there were no bosses anymore. And this has been a great learning experience. We sustained that for nine months to ship product faster, to make people more like in charge of projects. And that has been very re rewarding for us. Recently, we came back around to some sort of hierarchy because what we misunderstood and what we got wrong is it's not because you part way with management that you stop with structure altogether. In your organization, there are even association or companies, big or small, there's a value of um, mentoring, a value of enablement. And oftentimes we try to say, well, Management is the issue where if there's a structure, there's a problem. In fact, when we try to zoom out, and that's back to the last talk, is what makes people happy? What makes a great culture? And if you come to, um, to the workplace with a culture of enable enablement, very often enablement, meaning live, having you in charge, can work in different models. At times it will be having no management. Other times it will be making sure that you're quite aligned and that the entire company is moving towards one direction in particular. So w were you inspired by uh, some, some, maybe another question for, were you inspired by the examples of uh, the way other companies work and also by some uh, management theory like uh, Holacracy for instance? Sure, so Zappos, the uh, online shoemaker has been purchased by Amazon for a billion dollar. It's a fairly large company. I think they have or a thousand people, and they adopted a model called holacracy. Holacracy is no managers and people are decision makers. So essentially the person that closest to an opportunity to a problem will make a decision in a small group. So there's a lot of ownership there. And 15% of the employees left the company before, before the, uh, after this. That is correct. So there's different ways for you to take an existing group and make a big cultural change. Could that be for management or anything else? In this approach, it started to tell people they'll do things differently. And then a few, like 15%, decided it wasn't for them. They did not find themselves in a good situation. In this example, for instance, most of middle managers had to go back to be individual contributors. It means that you used to have a team of five to eight people, and you had to go back to find a place in the organization where you can contribute yourself as an influencer, but not a manager anymore. So this has been a great inspiration, and. I think this can be a very, very valid model for us. At times, you're trying to push a boulder up the mountain, and when you're distributed with an uncertain business model as a startup and a technology company moving fast, for us, it was a little bit too much to take on. Other times, like Medium, Medium.com, the startup from the uh, Twitter ex co-founder, tried Holacracy, and now they're trying a hybrid model, and Zappos is somewhat changing their approach. So to me, just to finish with that, the most important part is to be flexible in your approach and understand there'll be different steps along the way of the journey. 
and do you need flexible people in order to be flexible with in order to build a flexible governance i think that being open minded and again back to the culture in the environment if you feel confident in culture and leaders if not managers then you have a good starting base to start new models and be progressive so yes i think you do need people with an open mind aransa tell us about uh, the process of implementing more horizontality, more collaboration. We did a workshop with, uh, with your team uh, this morning where we had lots of conversations about how culture can change. Um, is, it, is it going easy? Like, do you feel like maybe some people will have to leave the company? And, and how do you make this work in a day-to-day -day basis? You know, I'm a very extremely optimistic, and uh, the plasticity of a human being is enormous, so I never uh, start thinking on who will not make it. I always start setting the context. So it's just becoming desirable to overcome management by leadership. Because uh, listening to you, and this is what I wanted to intervene there at that point in time, is that we very often make the confusion between management, which is really Ma related to task and processes and leadership, which is much more related to setting a context that is, is really creating um, a frame where really people engage and they can be creative. And, and at the same time, it's just uh, creating the environment where people can be enabled, can be developed, can get new skills, new, I mean, insights. Uh, and, and, and for me, it's really not the same thing. So I don't need management at all. What I need is a lot of leadership. And uh, when it comes to leadership, it's not a question of layers. It's a question of how, m how strong you are influencing the ecosystem around you by values, by exemplarity, uh, by setting the right conversations about the right thing with the right people at the right time. This is where it comes. For me, it's the most interesting thing. So to come to your question, it is easy? Not, it is not. It is to be done quick, no, it's going to take a, long, a lot of time. But uh, it is possible, I really believe it is possible and it's desirable. Everybody wants to be in a space where it's more uh, open, more flexible, where they can really contribute much more. And I think knowing what I know about what is going on in my company, when I get into the hotels, I see so the potential, I can smell it. They just need to get much, much more freedom to express it. What, what is the smell? It smells very good. Okay. <laughs> it smells very good because, uh, I mean, there is a lot of people that, that as soon as they feel much free, they will start being much more effective in terms of an anticipating and addressing customer needs. So what I need to work is on leadership. So making sure that the managers that were managers all their life, they were recognized, promoted, I mean, to, to their management skills, they really become leaders. And sometimes that is complex. And some, some of them, they will never make it just because they don't want to. So um, tell, us, tell us about the complexity. I mean, for me, the complexity is really make, making sure that as many as possible in the organization get the experience of freedom. So uh, I mean, bringing 40, 45 people here, uh, it is it's just a piece. It's just something that we can do to really show that things can happen differently. And there is freedom in the way we get in touch with others. Is the freedom uh, choosing the, the subject that I want to investigate. Uh, there is freedom around conversations I can establish about the uh, subject that I am interested on. And so it's not someone that is being imposed, it's something imposed. I mean, th there, there, there is freedom uh, in creating value, creating companies, creating connections. Uh, I mean, if we can uh, succeed to show uh, everyone in the organization that being free means performance, drives to performance, this is st extraordinarily useful. Yeah. I, I, I'd like to hear you about, both of you, maybe about the hiring process. So, you know, we, we, you wanna, if you want to change the culture or if you want to build a specific culture, what is, what is the hir uh, hiring process? Is it very structured? Like, are there like seven people who meet a potential new employees? Or is it also very free and very open? How, how does it work? Great. I'm very excited to hear your answer. I think it's going to be, it's going to be good. Um, at Buffer, we have, we're about 100 people. And at times, we're looking for 
an handful, like five or 10 extra people. And the different thing is we hire people without meeting them in person. So essentially, we try to be as transparent as possible at the, at the very start, which is we tell a story. When we have hardships, when we have wins, when we have doubts, we blog about it so that it becomes as transparent as possible. What we really want to get at is for applicants to have a what you see is what you get. Essentially, my goal is for someone that will onboard Buffer, will join on their first day, would feel that what they've read on blog posts, what they've seen in, uh, on the internet, is just what is it they leave as Let, well. Let's start two seconds on this because you are really a unique company for this. You're really going, going all in on transparency. You share like pretty much everything. Like, what, what do you don't share about your financial... Uh... Sure, so we share a lot of things. When I mean a lot of things, we share salaries, for instance. There's an online spreadsheet in blog post where there are 100 people, so there are 100 lines with 100 salaries that are available for anyone and everyone to see. So there's no gender gap in pay, for instance, because we base on a formula, so male and female get equal pay at the given post. Uh, we base it on location as well. Depending where you live, you get different amounts, and so on and so forth. So what don't we share? We share our metrics, we share salaries, we share our product roadmap. What we don't share, however, is transparency stops where privacy starts. So if something is deeply uncomfortable to someone or fully unlawful, we'll have to hold off from sharing it. We'll play on the verge of what it is we can share, and the theory is this, we'll default to transparency. When we have a decision to make, we'll default for this to be transparent, unless we have a very good and solid reason not to make it so. That could be cultural if privacy is invited for any reason, or legal, should that get to that point. In 15 seconds, the, the hiring process. Sure, hiring process is you see a listing, we get in touch by email, and then we're gonna interview with uh, three different people from a role, and then we make you an offer to join a boot camp. Boot camp is six week, and two out of three people graduate from boot camp and join us full time, and one out of three will go a different path and embrace a different, different career. Arangsa, hiring process, and what did you think about the transparency culture? Nothing to do with that, <laughs> but it's also the nature of the business. Are you, are you as transparent as Buffer at ACO? Or? Uh, hiring process or transparency? What are you asking for? Let's talk about, yeah. Okay, okay. let's start you by decide. the beginning. Okay. First question. Um, the uh, hiring process. I mean, we are in the service business, so uh, I, I cannot imagine myself, and I think uh, whoever you are going to ask, in the organization, even if you take one, one of the directors in any hotel, they are going to see people. I need to see if you love people. First of all, I need to see if you love yourself. First thing, because if you don't love yourself, I'm, I mean, I'm absolutely convinced you will not love each other. So if you ask me the question, I need to see people. I need to feel. And, and, um, and in, in general, in the service industry, uh, this, this is what you have. I mean, it's your human touch. It's, your, it's, it's how you look at, at the other, at, at someone else, how do you interact, how do you talk, and, and how do you feel yourself. So I, I would not, I mean, I can imagine uh, that it's very useful what you do, and, uh, and you, of course, you have various different uh, steps to, to check, but for us it's critical, the, uh, the human touch. So I will not align on that one. Uh, and then you have a lot of different uh, jobs in the organization that, that are back office. Of course, you, you may can do that with some of them, but not the majority, so that, that is for the, uh, for the uh, personality and, and the hiring. For the transparency, I would really love uh, you to understand that uh, when you, and I think Sebastian was very clear yesterday on that one, I mean, this is not a white page. When you heritage a uh, 200,000 people organization, I mean, you have a lot of history. So it, it is, I cannot imagine that there is gonna be transparency on the, uh, on the, uh, on the salaries already because you have, of course, as, li as, as many lines as, as, as as people, that is for sure, because of the history. So um, for, for the salaries, I mean, I would, I would really like to understand uh, how they feel it, how your, every single employee in your organization feel that, but I don't feel this is gonna be something uh, easy to put in place. Then transparency is much larger than that. For example, one of the things that I am focusing for next year, and we are really preparing the ground for that, and I think it's gonna change fundamentally the, the capability that we have to really bring people work together is peer-to-peer -to -peer evaluation. 
which I really think is really targeting what we want. It's just creating the capability for, for everyone to, to really, really work with each other. Whether they are in the same team or in another team, just, just you, I mean, it's customer relationships. You are adding value to others in many, many situations, and it's not the boss who sees that. I mean, the best assessor is those that you are working, working closely, not, even not only the customer. So that is really transparent, and, and it's going to boost the capability of collaboration, and I think it's very critical. So in that way, we just took another path to that, to transparency, and also engaging everyone in, in giving honest feedback uh, so every, everyone can learn from each other. Guys, I'm sorry, but the, the, the time indicates 20, but it seems we only have three or four minutes, so we have time for probably one question. So who has the smartest question in the audience? <laughs> what? Uh, I I was wondering, what is the good outcomes that uh, came with the transparency, and did it influence other companies to also go transparent? So transparency, I think, is, is part of values, for Buffer at least, part of values. So it is how we want to conduct ourselves in private life, in business as well. I think it did drive our number of applicants up. We did have many people come as a consequence, but that wasn't the primary driver for us. And we are seeing today more startups telling the story as well, uh, based on the transparency basis, where you steer away from just, you know, I'm selling product A, here is why product A is great, and being a bit more genuine, just like, like last talk, being more genuine about your approach and sharing your struggles as well as your victories. Any unintended bad consequence? Transparency. The only thing that is a little bit tricky, um, when we have people joining with families, we have a separate grant that goes towards um, dependents. So if they are kids, for instance, we allow to have a bonus action on that. And we've been debating whether it's a good thing or no for people to know publicly whether, as a company, we give a grant to people to support their kids should they decide to do that. So we have many question marks and many more to come, especially on, on culture, on ethics, and on legal. But Hopefully, we'll keep working through that as we go along. Um, I think till now, we have focused on what are the challenges for big companies to go horizontal. But I wanted to also to know what are the challenges for you to teach people to work in that way? Because I think persons, just like you said, are just like organizations are not blank pages. And we are taught to learn in this way that uh, we need to be told what we need to do. And I can imagine that even if we're working with young people, you, it's something new for you too. That's yeah, so this is a corporate journey where your startup or company is going to go through. And there's a personal journey for you to be willing to accept this, embrace it, and feel that it's an environment where you feel like striving. Our biggest mistake was that we parted away with management, but we also parted away with leadership, for instance. And we didn't have room for enablement anymore. We didn't have room to give constructive feedback, and that was a very tricky spot because this jumping out of the airplane and just removing parachute altogether, it didn't feel like a uh, environment that was nurturing. So that's a mistake we've made, and should we do it again? I think providing a great framework for people to adapt into a transition, after time is better than just, boom, making it change all of a sudden. Adam, say so you want to say something on this? Yeah, I mean... For sure, it's, uh, it's graduation, but uh, I mean, there is w one of the things that is most difficult to deal with is fears. So you need to be very careful how much fear the organization and the people living in the organization is able to carry and overcome. So uh, and it's really fine-tuning. So you need to really make a, a conscious choice of, of you know, what is going to be the path to transparency. And uh, I, I think evaluation and feedback is, is an enormous piece in the big organizations, especially because they are really siloed, or organized, and people are unable to work together. And if you choose something that is extremely handicapping uh, for the organization to innovate and transform, it is exactly that. So I, I think transparency for us, for the big organizations, should tackle immediately feedback, immediately. And it's also helping people to develop and the organization to grow. So it's just a conscious choice. And you manage the, the, the amount of fear that it is, uh, it is the organization is able to carry and overcome. 
Uh, and then every organization is different. You just need to understand what, what is, you know, the, uh, the Cayuda and Asasio that is really, really doing bad. And then, then tackle that. Uh, you, cannot do a, you cannot address everything. One of the, uh, the key things in transparency is how many people have access to the strategy and even more, how many people in the organization can contribute to build the strategy. And this is key. And, and it's an extraordinary exercise of transparency and trust. So uh, just choose what is really critical and start working on that. Managing always the kind, the amount of fear uh, to handle. Um, I had a question for you, Ransa. So you, a core who tells us come for the first time to We Share Fest, and it's at the close of the third day. And I wondered what you have taken away, you individually and perhaps as a team, from being at an event like this and, and interacting with a group like this. Uh, first, first thing, and it's a very personal answer. I mean, I have here a lot of people from the team, and I see their faces, and I got their feedback, and I see they spend two wonderful days. First of all, together, uh, they are coming from different countries, different fields, and they spend time, quality time together, just feeling free to talk, to discuss, to address, to go there and there, and, and getting in touch with people that they never met before. So only that is an enormous uh, win. Uh, so tackling on what I want, that is a uh, path done. Uh, secondly, I mean, uh, I mean, it would be interesting to just get to them and ask them, collectively, what, what do you want to carry? Um, I, of course, got a lot of insights from them, but uh, I mean, this is more content. What I, I would really like them to, uh, to, uh, to really get is how they can work differently starting right now when they come back to the office. Um, and, and I think they got some insights. Now they need to test and try to do it effectively and get all the learnings out of that. So, uh, of course, there are contacts. They are, they are, they are startups that are interested uh, and we are interested in working with. Uh, this is very concrete, but it's also in terms of cultural transformation, what they get in terms of working differently, enjoying differently, and, and getting something different out of that. I mean, ask them. I mean, they are there. And they are all wonderful people. So we're going to talk with them afterwards. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for this panel. <laughs>